Uh, it means that uh, all the rules are absolutely the same. Uh, we are ready to uh, see your presentation for 20 minutes. After that, two, two teams will prepare their uh, questions and uh, we are looking for debates. Um, so let's get started. If everyone is ready, please team number four, uh, share your screen and uh, please be careful about the deadline, only 20 minutes. It means that you will finish at uh, 25. Uh, yeah, 25. So let's get started. Okay, is it working? Yeah. Is the sound uh, okay and the picture? Yes. Okay, so let's start. Hi guys, today we're talking about digital revolutions and how new technologies influence on the mass protest strategy. Um, a little bit about the summary of the topics. Today we will talk about some key features of the digital protest. We will mention several cases which we think are important to understand our topic. These are Arab Spring, uh, Hong Kong protest, uh, Belarus revolution and digital protest uh, story in Russia. And in the end, we will uh, somehow uh, have a summary uh, or, and the results uh, of our presentation and uh, our topic of digital revolutions. So let's start with some um, key features of digital protests of, and revolutions. The first thing is the uh, spread and the massive using of social media and uh, internet uh, sources to mobilize uh, people for protest or to coordinate protests, somehow to organize them. And of course, the uh, internet is also about the sharing information about the protest activity about the governmental uh, activities and governmental decisions. Um, the third thing is that the, in the modern world, the digital protests are really decentralized. So there is uh, often there is no leaders of this protest and it is self-organization or a horizontal organization. The uh, fourth thing is the crowdfunding. The crowdfunding is used uh, for uh, organizing prote protest, for uh, supporting some participants. Uh, and the last one is the, uh, like the, the general thing, it is the replacing of uh, traditional institutions with digital one, for example, new media with the old one, like internet media against the TV and uh, so on. So the first thing I will talk about is the Arab Spring, which happened in 2010, uh, 2012. These were the revolutions of uh, in Arabic countries like uh, Egypt, uh, Libya, uh, and so on. There were many different revolutions over Syria, and it was the first period of history when uh, people and pro participants of these protests uh, really used the internet to mobilize uh, citizens to protest through Facebook and Twitter. These were two most uh, important platforms um, during these revolutions. And of course, the YouTube and uh, some internet host video hostings, uh, these were the means, uh, the tools which help people to, um, to keep and to save information and to show it to everyone about the violence by security forces and it was really useful for the uh, international media and international attention to revolutions because previously there was uh, it was really complicated. You need to have, I don't know, a very spread uh, infrastructure with different people who can capture the video from the protest and then send it to other country and then to, uh, to prepare a material there. And it, it takes a long time, but during the Arab Spring, it was like uh, online watching of the protest and it was really important for international attention, like uh, everyone in the world uh, could have some information about the uh, revolution on uh, Tahrir Square in uh, Egypt, for example, yeah? And let's continue with Hong Kong. Oh, okay, uh, the next thing I would like to talk about is Hong Kong. Uh, the summer and early autumn of uh, 2019 was a season of protest for Hong Kong. The large-scale demonstrations were caused by the attempts of city authorities to start a legal merge with uh, mainland China 
and adopt the law for extradition of criminals uh, to Chinese prisons. Social media such as Facebook and Twitter were used to publish provocative photos and videos of police aggression. Uh, now the main opposition uh, communication and coordination were carried out uh, through the messages such as Telegram, WhatsApp, or Sino and FireChat. Uh, the most popular one is Telegram, which has an encryption function allowing to anonymize and protect the users. Uh, Telegram channels uh, contains actual information about rally plans uh, and uh, maps with activists and police movements and also location of pharmacies and grocery stores. Uh, another messenger is the fire chat, which runs on a cell network principle, so allowing the smartphones to stay in touch even if the authorities uh, shut down the internet and mobile communication. Uh, protesters also use other platforms, for instance, uh, dating service Tinder and uh, uh, to publish uh, routes of demonstrations and uh, streaming platform Twitch to broadcast live from the meeting. Uh, Apple Airdrop allows to share information with closed iPhones to quickly coordinate some actions. The Ubi drivers send their contacts through the Telegram and pick up activists who need help uh, during the demonstration. Another important action is economic boycott against Chinese government. Hong Kong citizens uh, withdraw money from credit cards and refuse to buy goods from companies cooperating with the authorities. They store money in cash or in cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, Monero and Zcash. Uh, where transactions are carried out in private blockchains, so it's hard to track down the users. However, the Chinese gov government and police uh, also use digital technologies to confront protesters. They use their access to Octopus cards, the most popular travel and credit cards in Hong Kong. Via the Octopus, uh, the authorities can control travels and transactions of activists and uh, even distantly collect the information about people in the crowd, in the crowd uh, during the rally. Uh, both activists and, go and the government uh, use uh, social media to form their opinion and get support of citizens and from abroad. The social network Weibo becomes uh, the main platform where the Chinese government publish its view of the situation in Hong Kong uh, and ban all oppositional content here. Activists uh, post the information uh, on Facebook, Twitter and online forum Reddit uh, and trans translate it all into English to form the opinion of Western society on the situation. Activists also make an online petitions uh, in the platform GoFundMe. Uh, the petitions calls uh, to the British government uh, to stand up for the Hong Kong independence and uh, condemn the cruelty of the police. Uh, and the next, next topic uh, is uh, protests in Belarus. Oh. Okay. Uh, mass protests in Belarus began in August 2020 after the presidential election and victory of Alexander Lukashenko, which was falsified, as many people believe. Telegram channels uh, published provocative photos and videos of police cruelty during the crackdown uh, and after it, uh, and also coordinate uh, rallies by sending dangerous areas, uh, places where activists need medical help or could hide from the police. Another important action is denonymization, uh, which is uh, carried out uh, in Telegram by the groups of cyber partisans. They access to police databases and publish uh, personal information about them. Uh, op uh, opinions are divided on this way of protest. On the one hand, it can frighten members of riot police and show them that uh, their violence will uh, will not go unpunished. On the other hand, it endangers innocent families of officers. Moreover, activists say that the database was composed in 2018, and so it is uh, 
not completely relevant now. So ex-officers who didn't take part in uh, the crackdown may suffer. Government also use uh, digital technologies to confront protesters. The authorities fully control official mass media, so there were no information about rallies on the TV when they started. Then, in official uh, reports, the government form public opinion and get support, especially from elders, who use mainly TV as a source of information. Also, on August 8, uh, the day before the election, a disruption of internet connection began in Belarus and uh, uh, continued a few days after the election. The government and uh, mobile operator Bell Telecom blame uh, foreign hackers. However, there is an opinion that uh, the authorities purposely blocked access to the internet with uh, trafficking filtering equipment uh, to discoordinate pro uh, protests and uh, slow down information spreading. Yeah, and I will continue with uh, my speech about the digital protest story in Russia. Well, the first well-known case is the uh, protests for fair elections or Balotny Square protests in 2011-2012. Uh, it was the story about uh, uh, new media versus the old one, because uh, in, in Russia, the traditional uh, media are controlled by the regime. They are state-owned or they are, are proto-state uh, channels like Antevenia. And uh, there are new, there were new media like uh, bloggers or uh, internet uh, medias like Lentaru. And of course, this influenced uh, also because of the growth of the internet audience in Russia during that time. And uh, at that moment, the, the most uh, important platforms for mobilizing protests were LiveJournal, Facebook, Vkontakte, and uh, Twitter. You can see on the screen the LiveJournal by Alexei Navalny, which was really uh, popular during that time. And uh, all these four platforms were uh, used uh, by Russian opposition to uh, to spread information about the falsifications on, on the state Duma election in 2011 and to, to mobilize people on protests. And uh, after this wave of protests, there was a, a re uh, the reaction of the Russian authorities, of the Russian regimes. They tried to uh, strengthen regulation of the internet, especially uh, over Russian platforms. And there were a lot of new uh, bills and new legislation which are restricted the freedom of speech on the Russian internet, restricted the uh, ownership on uh, media, which affected on Pontankaru, for example, yeah, like the foreigner people, they cannot have some influence on, uh, on, on media and so on, or there is uh, some laws which restricts the, uh, some posts in the internet and, and so on. And nowadays we see also the transformation of these protests. Uh, yeah, uh, starting with 2017, uh, nowadays the, uh, we have two new platforms which are important as well. These are Telegram as in Belarus or in uh, Hong Kong and YouTube channels. They're important uh, as alternatives to the traditional media. Uh, and to, there is a spread of using crowdfunding for organizing meetings or for organizing political campaigns or supporting organizations like FBK. And there is a spread infrastructure of help for uh, participants of meetings like uh, over the info or Agora. They spread information about how many people are uh, took by the police, uh, are caught by the police and what problems they uh, might have, uh, have after that. And there is a support of uh, jurists after the protests and all, all this stuff works uh, by, by the crowdfunding uh, support and also in the youtube there are many internet broadcasts with, which shows the uh, police violence for example on the moscow protests yeah and uh, we see that the main topics of the protests are repressions ecology some urban problems uh, or some unfair elections like last year, or corruption like uh, on Valmy Dimon in 2017. 
and we see that the state uh, continues to restrict internet freedom. For example, uh, in the last year, they adopted the bill, which is known like sovereign internet uh, bill to uh, somehow control the, tra the internet traffic to have the more effective ban of uh, platforms like Telegram or some websites which uh, Russian authorities think are dangerous for them because such regimes like uh, uh, informational autocrats, they try to control the in information, the spread of it and the sources of information. And uh, let's have a little summary. Uh, what we have uh, in this new area of digital protest, what, which are the, what, what are the results of it? Well, for protesters, the first thing is, of course, the spreading of information through internet and social media. The, to mobilize people or to have some information about the protests or police violence. But there is a danger of fake news because in the uh, social media, sometimes there is too much information and it is really hard to understand which is fake and which is not. The next thing, of course, this is the uh, fi financing campaigns, crowdfunding, which I mentioned, uh, are really important in organizing protests or helping its participants after that. Uh, also, de decentralization, uh, because there, it's a horizontal uh, structured protest, and you cannot just imprison leaders because there is no leaders of this protest. But it is also a minus for participants because it is difficult to convert protests into some real political decisions sometimes. Yeah, and the last thing is the dynamization uh, of those who are engaged in repression. And this is like the social control of those people who are engaged in repressions or in police violence. And for the authorities, there are also some drawbacks and some pluses. Uh, of course, traditional media are losing popularity, but authoritarian regimes, they began to censor the internet or to control it somehow, or to, uh, or they try to uh, implement their own state propaganda there, like uh, Chinese government during the Hong Kong protests. And it is uh, hard, of course, to fight these protests. And it is uh, uh, hard to cut uh, off traditional funding sources because people can use cryptocurrencies or they can use crowdfunding. It is uh, really um, hard just to close the, the bank or something like this, yeah. And the last thing is the digital tools for repression. Uh, again, China, yeah, or, or even Russia because you can monitor social networks or you can use camera, cameras with the physical recognition system and then find people who are participating in the protests. And uh, uh, there is a one big myth that uh, you can, I don't know, uh, foreign government can organize the digital protests uh, and we can dream on this digital protest that this is a political technology which is used in different countries. But the reality is that there is actually no single strategy because it is impossible to uh, direct a horizontal structured protest with no leaders. And uh, of course, there are different strategies how to organize protests or how to uh, stop them. And actually authoritarian regimes, they are able to adopt. They really uh, look after each other and they look uh, what is the experience of different countries and how they can prevent these protests or how they can solve the problem of this protest. So of course, this is a myth. And here are our references. We send our presentation. You, you can uh, watch some videos or write some, uh, sorry, uh, read some articles about the digital protests in Russia, Belarus, Hong Kong, and so on. And now we're uh, we're done, and we can answer your questions. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so number uh, team number, just one second, please. Um, there are two teams, two teams for debates number one and three, please. Uh, who is ready? Let's get started. And uh, first of all, tell me how many questions you have. And uh, let's uh, get started with the first one. Uh, okay, well, I can start. Uh, my group has seven questions. Uh, so the first Excuse question... Me, please. And uh, what is your group number? Uh, number one. Okay. Um, so the first question is, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was a great one. Um, our first question is, uh, do you think that uh, government's intervention to the digital protest will increase the protest or reduce its power? 
Uh, okay, uh, I think I'd, I can answer. Um, authorities usually try to confront the opposition and, uh, of course, reduce its power. Uh, the degree of government's intervention depends on political regime and uh, level of control of mass media. Um, authorities try to control the information flow and uh, reduce the spread of information about the rallies. Uh, to do this, uh, they can uh, forbid the discussion of protest on TV or ban oppositional content on sites and social network. Uh, sometimes uh, the authorities are even able to block the internet connection in areas of rallies, uh, as it happened in Belarus, uh, India and uh, Kazakhstan. Mm, I think that's all. Okay, thanks. Um, and my second question is, uh, you already mentioned that uh, government is trying sometimes to prevent the protest, but uh, do you think there is a way to prevent a digital protest using the same technologies like social media or uh, streaming platforms? Is there such a way? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that the problem here is that uh, the reason of the protest is not in the technologies because technologies are just tools. The reasons always are political. So to prevent the protests, you need to uh, have a situation when these protests are useless. So you need to solve some problems by political tools, which are uh, which became the reasons of this protest. I don't know if you have uh, problems with registration of candidates and you uh, have the problem of protest. It is better to actually register these candidates and there will be no protests. Yeah. But uh, of course, uh, some authoritarian regimes, they uh, used uh, some tools to uh, somehow uh, stop the spread of opposition content on the internet. They can ban sites, they can even uh, turn off the internet, but not in every, every country, for example, in Belarus, as uh, Paulina said. But uh, I'm not sure that this uh, strategy is useful because if you ban the internet, you will. Uh, you will have a very big negative reaction of all people, even those who are not uh, participating in the protest, because internet nowadays is very uh, important for the economy. And if you will ban such a big sector of the economy, we will have the increase of the protest, not the decrease. Yeah, that's great. I think that uh, I could add that uh, this is the measure of political will uh, because uh, you have to know what could, what, what could you do to achieve your goals uh, and um, the level of uh, necessary steps is uh, um, just, uh, just um, there is uh, the very hard collaboration between uh, the political structures and uh, the level of uh, mm, uh, your decisions are uh, have to be controlled by the political willingness of each person. So this is just uh, the question about the uh, political structure of uh, the government, the government structure, and this is the issue about uh, the uh, country. Finally. So the next one, please. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I'll continue. Uh, so you have um, mentioned uh, that um, uh, new type of uh, process uh, can be difficulty uh, converted into political uh, decisions. But uh, uh, I want to specify. Uh, so can this type of process uh, be productive and make real political or social changes? And if yes, what conditions are necessary for satisfying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course uh, they can. Uh, like every protest, they can or they cannot. It depends on the political situation and the political regime that you have. Because And uh, you, you need to understand that uh, the most important thing here is the institutional structure of uh, your civil society and the state. Uh, for example, uh, in Hong Kong, after these protests, uh, digital protests uh, as well, uh, there were uh, parliamentary elections in Hong Kong and a lot of opposition candidates which supported the protests or participated in them, 
they won a lot of seats in the Hong Kong protests, and they banned a lot of bills which they think are too authoritarian and too pro-Chinese because they have in Hong Kong some oppositional parties which are which can participate in elections. So they have some institutional organizations uh, which can uh, I don't know which can uh, help you to uh, have some goals after this protest. And we can compare it with the Belarus where there was only this in Russian it calls Kardinusolny Soviet Opposition, so the oppositional council, but it uh, didn't have a real opportunity to uh, to participate officially in politics because uh, there is no real there were no, no real elections in Belarus. There is a uh, like uh, authoritarian regime. Uh, a personalist dictatorship by Lukashenko, and uh, there were no spread and split of elites in this country, and that's why they actually failed. So the well, we don't know. Uh, maybe it will change us somehow, but now it is uh, very difficult for them uh, somehow to uh, really influence on decision making process because of institutions. It is the most important thing here. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, it's really, uh, depends on institutions and the regime. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, next one is, uh, um, about, uh, control, uh, from foreign governments. You have, uh, in fact, answered it yet, but, um, I want to, uh, uh specify too. Uh, so, do you believe that uh, some protests um, can be organized technically by foreign government? Uh, I'm not uh, talking about, um, mm, I know, uh, rational uh, nature of this uh, <laughs> control, but uh, technically, could it be? Mm. Oh no. I think uh, I think it, it's really hard to say like what do you mean by technically, but um, I, I actually it is a very uh, spread myth, especially in Russia, that foreign governments can somehow really organize a big mass protest. Because to have a mass protest, you need to have a very uh, very important uh, problem inside the country, and people or they have some uh, I don't know some uh, rational choice or something like this. So people are able to choose uh, are they want to participate in protests or uh, are they do, do not want to do this. But of course, there is some uh, infrastructure or organizations which are support the organization of protests, but they actually are inside the country. For example, opposition parties, NGOs, or some uh, even medias or YouTube bloggers and so on which are pro, pro protest, uh, which have pro protest position. And uh, actually the influence of foreign governments is very, very limited in this kind of protests. And uh, you mm -hmm. also need to understand that uh, it is a very, uh, I don't know, simplified view on politics that uh, uh, governments uh, or, or foreign countries are not divided inside themselves because in uh, in every state there are a lot of different actors which are acting differently. Yeah, cool. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if some uh, foreign organization uh, somehow, I don't know, uh, if, for example, New York Times is uh, making uh, article about the protests in Egypt, it doesn't mean that the American government is supporting the protests or something like this. Okay, thank you. And my last uh, question uh, mm, uh, will be that. Uh, so, uh, can digital tools be used to pull down any political movement and make in fully controlled uh, totalitarianism? Or uh, is it impossible in our world of information? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I understand your question. I think it is connected with the current situation in China. Yes, you can look mostly. On the, yeah, you can look on the experience of Chinese repressions against Uyghurs or in Tibet, how they use the digital tools to uh, to repress people there for their, I don't know, religion or some political positions. They use uh, face recognition systems and this uh, social credit system to ban uh, some uh, uh, something for um, civil uh, for, for for sorry for citizens which are not politically loyal. But actually, we need to understand that uh, Chinese regimes in political science is called closed authoritarianism. So it's still the authoritarian regime. Uh, but uh, with no elections or with a very low political uh, engagement of people. It's not a totalitarian regime because totalitarian regime is about mass repressions, really mass repressions, like, I don't know, Stalin says, sir, yeah? Uh, and it is about the um, ideology control and the violent mass participation of people in politics. So uh, the Chinese maybe, the Chinese regime maybe only partly uh can be uh said that they all the only party have these features but uh, china now is an authoritarian country not totalitarian and i'm not sure that it will somehow change okay so uh in uh in your way of thinking it uh could not evolve into totalitarianism I think that totalitarian regimes are uh, in history and more connected with the 20th century. And it is just impossible f to fully control the society. Yeah, uh, that was about my question. Thank okay. you. My colleagues will continue. Uh, yeah, uh, during the whole presentation in cases, you mentioned that um, opposition forces use uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, in the, all of cases. And what makes these uh, certain apps uh, prefer preferable for such processes? Uh, I think I can answer. Uh, opposition can use many platforms, uh, but uh, Facebook and Twitter are so widely used uh, because they're just more popular uh, than other social networks. Uh, Twitter is uh, intended to make some statements and uh, publish your ideas. Uh, and uh, Facebook enables activists to create events uh, to um, ra rallies organization. And uh, the second question, uh, how does using of digital tools change uh, representation of different social groups in protests? Mm, it's a good question. I think uh, that it is really connected with the, uh, our informational era and the spread of the internet, because nowadays uh, some little social groups, which were not really uh, I don't know, famous and widely spread previously, and now they have the platform to di directly communicate with the audience. And that's why some little social groups are becoming more um, important and more powerful than previously, because previously there were the traditional media era with television or papers, and the access to them was limited uh, in authoritarian regimes by, by the authorities, yeah. Or in even in democracies, uh, newspapers uh, are not really like traditional newspapers are not really interested in promoting some ideas of um, little minority groups. But with the internet, uh, they have this opportunity to uh, um, to talk about their ideas, and of course, the digital tools in protest they. Uh, show that these little groups are becoming more and more uh, influential and uh, we knew, know much more about them than previously. Thank you for answers. Our group is then finished. <clears throat> okay. Mm, the, uh, there are some questions from team three. Uh, I'm really interested in the actions uh, about the in case of uh, Arabic Spring. So 
did the war or and violence violent protests occur under the slogan democracy and freedom or this was the consequence of internet i mean that could it happen could it happen even there is no social online media mm -hmm. okay look um previously the, with no internet there were a lot of uh, different protests in hybrid or authoritarian regime countries uh, but uh, the pro participants, they just use some traditional tools to uh, spread the information in, uh, among the citizens. But the Arab Spring was just the first case when the internet was so uh, rapidly and so uh, spread among the pr participants of the protests. And of course, uh, uh, the protests, they could be without the internet and we have a very long history of these protests. Uh, but the internet was like the very useful tool for this Arab Spring uh, revolutions. And I think it was one of the key features, not why it happened, but how it happened and what was what, what were the consequences of the of these revolutions. Okay, uh, you mean that it, it, it uh, could have uh, happened without internet, yes? Um, yeah, but uh, I think that the spread of uh, protests and was like different without the internet. Okay. So the reason is not internet. The reason, the the uh, purpose, the aim of uh, politic. Yes. Uh, yeah. Of course. Uh, always the reasons of the protests are political. Okay. Okay. And uh, the next question is also connected with it. And uh, why? were mass protests uh, so influential and harmful uh, while there was an opportunity to use social uh, online media for safety, for protection, or uh, maybe for uh, uh, mitigating some protests, some uh, battles between the uh, people and the uh, soldiers. Why the governments uh, didn't uh, use this kind of tools in order to and minimize the uh, damage among the people well because the it, because if you only write something bad about the government and if you organize some online uh, meetings with other people it will absolutely not or it will be little uh, influence on the state policy because uh, uh, if you have a real uh, protest in real life this would be more useful if you have i don't I don't know, uh, thousands or uh, much millions of people uh, on the streets, this always would be more useful than just uh, some internet boycotts or internet meetings. And uh, the well, one thing I can say about the violence on this protest is that actually nowadays the biggest part of the protests are uh, non-violent and there is like a very big story of a non-violent protest strategy and the uh, philosophy of non-violent protest. And uh, nowadays we see that it continues, but if uh, the, but the protest may become violent of two okay. reasons. First reason is like police violence and the second reason are some radicals. Okay, no, uh, I mean that uh, we see that um, people try to spread any kind of their uh, dissatisfaction uh, through the internet, through the social media. Uh, I'm really interested why the government or people who uh, claim the peace and the friendship relationship, why they uh, don't try to manage this kind of uh, disagreement among people and minimizing this kind of disagreements through the social media too. I'm really interested why they use the soldiers, why you why you, they use the force, why they damage uh, people, not just uh, explaining through the social media. Because I think the good tool to, uh, to tackle with this kind of disagreement in social media is using some kind of uh, peaceful uh, strategies, plans in social media too. Mm, okay. Well, first thing is that we live in society and the violence is uh, still uh, really spread, but less spread than previous uh, centuries. But uh, uh, again, uh, 
protests in real lives are still more effective than, than just some digital tools. And the, the governments, when they see this protest, they some, somehow try to solve the problems of this protest, even by violence. And if we will take the case with some contradictions uh, and how to solve contradictions in the internet, we see that actually political uh, debates in the internet is, are, is a very toxic and aggressive um, uh, thing. And uh, if you just use media uh, into, if, if you will write, uh, read something uh, in it, you will see that th there is a lot of aggression there and it is absolutely not peaceful. And uh, of course we cannot uh, somehow, I don't know, we, we cannot split uh, our uh, political life into a uh, digital one and to real. Okay, I see your answer. And uh, the next question is, um, it's about the, uh, about the planning, this kind of events. Did any government or any kind of opposition draw out some plans uh, of, uh, uh, meeting, uh, of making this kind of protest or maybe some kind of platforms where the people uh, are taught to make this kind of protests uh, against the uh, certain uh, power in government or in the city? Is there any kind of platform or they just random thing? Uh, I think... Uh the the uh, there isn't such a platform when uh, some someone teach people how to take part in protests uh, the common things about uh, all these digital protests is that they happen in modern digital world world uh, so uh, it is also a reason why digital tools are widely used uh, so um, Protests happen uh, because of problems in society, in economic uh, and politics, and uh, uh, it is a desire of people to change something. And uh, digital technologies are only a tool to do this, and uh, no one purposely uh, teaches people to use internet plat platforms. So it's uh, it it happens just randomly. Yes, you mean. Yeah, oh. just people take the, some kind of messages, videos on YouTube and go out the street and uh, try to beat or claim something from government. Mm, I think, yes, it happens uh, after some problems uh, in society, mm, not just uh, because of some messages. Uh, people mm, are not happy with the uh, situation in their country. Uh, and that's why they start to organize themselves uh, through the internet. Okay, I take and uh, your answer. And uh, I think uh, this is all for our team. Yes. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, there were great questions. I will add um, to the team number four um, about the uh, very specific theory of the uh, Soviet Union crash. Uh, sorry, I remember the name of scientist who created it, but uh, the main idea of his uh, theory is that uh, the main um, the main reason of the Soviet Union crash was uh, the ability uh, of uh, the government to control uh, all the uh, social uh, networks, all the social um, connections uh, before. But in the 19th, uh, this ability wa was uh, decreased. And finally, uh, there were a lot of um, newspapers, a lot of uh, sources of uh, free information without the censorship. And um, it was created, they were created a lot of uh, information agencies uh, in the USA and Europe, they were connected with the people inside the Soviet Union and uh, the government wasn't able to control it. And um, there, were, um, it, it were next, there was next stage of the society that was uh, uh, 
created in uh, the Europe and the USA before, but the Soviet Union uh, faced with it only in uh, on on this stage. And um, I think that it is very interesting uh, if we are thinking about uh, our ways. Uh, our possible directions, our future, because uh, sometimes I think that uh, we are uh, on the next stage of development of our society when there are a lot of sources uh, that uh, the government cannot control because the government is not so flexible as uh, the society itself. And um, uh, the, the goal to control everything and to be better as the, your... Um, mm, as somebody, somebody else in the society is for government very difficult because yeah, so government is not flexible and using the modern tools is very hard issue for it. So um, this is the reason why society uh, wasn't able to control, uh, why the government wasn't able to control the society of the social networks. And uh, if you're looking for um, any examples in the Belarus, for example, uh, or for the censorship or for the uh, news that was created, that were created by the uh, censorship um, departments and by the government, uh, you will understood that uh, this is uh, the quality of that news are very bad uh, and uh, that the government isn't able to do it better than uh, the society itself. So um, this is um, the theory. If uh, somebody will be interested in it, you could find it in the internet. Uh, but uh, sorry, I repeat it again, I forget the name of scientists who created it. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation. There is a uh, very actual um, idea, very actual for everyone. Uh, and um, a very interesting, there were very interesting questions. Thank you too. So uh, that's all. If someone have any question, please ask me. And if not, uh, I'm looking for your reviews on my emails as uh, before. Uh, sorry, and uh, groups number one and four, uh, and <laughs> uh, and the Three. yes, Three. and the third one. Uh, uh, don't uh, send you a review, yeah? Yeah, I'm looking for reviews uh, uh, from the groups number two, five, six, seven, and eight. Because, okay. uh, yeah, the first and the third group uh, was uh, uh, take the part into the debates and uh, um, group number for prepare the presentation. So the next uh, the next time uh, the group number seven and six uh, have to prepare their questions and uh, group number five, please prepare your presentation. And please don't forget to send me to email uh, because uh, I have to uh, be able to prepare my question too <laughs> because today I haven't uh, the presentation at my email. Uh, so that's all. Uh, sorry, can you repeat, please? <laughs> what groups uh, are next? The next groups are just one second six and uh, seven. Uh, and uh, the group number five, please prepare your presentation. So, presentation from the group number five and group number six and seven are, uh, have to prepare their questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.